I will. Uh, did you make uh, Christoph uh, presenter? Yes. Okay, so you can. Uh, and I, can I already will share my screen if you want. And yeah, sure, are... sure. And uh, uh, let me uh, get my notes here to introduce you. I did my homework. I went to your uh, lattice, and uh, so it's a it's a a, pre a pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Deneke from Unicamp here today. Uh, Professor Deneke got his uh, bachelor at uh, TU Darmstadt in Germany in 2000. Uh, he got his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research in Stuttgart in 2005 working at the von Klitzen uh, department. Uh, he got a postdoc too at uh, the Max Planck in Stuttgart, again with the von Klitzen group from 2005 to 2007. He had a position in the Leibniz Institute in Dresden from 2007 to 2011 before he switched to Brazil where he uh, was from 2011 to 2017 at the LN Nano, at the, uh, it's, a, it's a division of the uh, uh, Laboratorio Nacional de Buicirto. And then since 2017, he's a professor at, uh, at the Gladwatagen uh, Institute uh, of Physics at uh, Unicampi, uh, as I said, since 2019. So in today he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, the title of his talk is Semiconductor Nanomembranes as a Versatile Platform to Tune Physical Properties. So Professor uh, Deneke, well, it, uh, I thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The microphone is yours. So uh, first, thank you for inviting me and giving me the chance to to give the seminar. And I remember Überlandia. I've been in Überlandia uh, 2015 for the Brazilian workshop of semiconductor science. I never, I just remember that the, the people were nice, but I never know who was actually the organizer. So if if you were if you if somebody in the audience was part of the organization committee, I liked it there. <laughs> so. And so I will use the chance here to make a little bit advertising for uh, semiconductor uh, membranes and how to use them for tuning the physical properties of a semiconductor material. For this, I will start for giving you an overview what are nanomembranes and how to make rolled up nanotubes out of them. And then I will focus basically on two things that we did during the time in Brazil. One is that we use them for the band engineering of a heterostructure. And the other one that we use them as virtual substrates for the overgrowth of uh, semiconductor heterostructures. And then of course I will give a summary as everybody does. So let's jump right into it. So for those who are a little bit longer in the field, you will remember that there are two D materials around and Actually, the idea, the predecessors for this kind of two-dimensional materials um, came in around 2000 when people started to release very thin nanometer-thick films from their substrates. In this time, we had a strain gradient inside and they started to roll up on the substrate, forming nanometer-sized objects. And this actually got quite some nice attention because we were able to, to uh, establish this kind of self-formation nano objects. And then later people uh, started to continue to work with this. And around the time when graphene entered the field, people started also to uh, use the same method to make flat films. Uh, and then we got this kind of wrinkled nano membranes and wrinkled networks that uh, became then very famous around and people started also to create other kind of um, three-dimensional nano objects using the same principle, always uh, detaching a film from a substrate. So I normally work with three, five semiconductor heterostructures, but the uh, method by itself is very versatile. So how do we make these structures? Um, basically, 
for the rolled up nanotube bit, like being invented by a Russian guy called Victor Prince, and he published this in Physica A. So some brilliant ideas I always like to show this are published in very low impact journals. <laughs> because it was actually a conference proceeding, but I think this paper is uh, cited by now some 600 times or whatsoever. So basically what he suggested was you grow a heterostructure and as I said, like when I'm talking about heterostructures, I'm always referring normally to um, three, five heterostructures. So material class is gallium arsenide. And what you do is you design the system that you will have a sacrificial layer. I normally use aluminum arsenide and you detach and you put a strained layer on top of it, which we normally make out of indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide. So, and by now a lot of different material classes have been used, but as I said, I'm, I'm always stick to the three fives. So if I talk about strain system, I'm referring normally to an indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide system. And if I refer to a selective etching and a sacrificial layer, it's normally aluminium arsenide. So what you then do is you open the access to this uh, sacrificial layer and you do a selective etching process. In the selective etching process, you remove the sacrificial layer and you release your top layers, which are nanometer thick from their substrate. Since we, in this case, made a strain system that has a strain gradient inside, you will uh, gain a torque inside the system and the system will start to curl and to roll up and it forms a rolled up nanotube right on the uh, top of this um, of your substrate. And then you can, of course, say like, ah, I don't want a three dimensional object. I want something flat. So basically you can use the same principle again. You again grow a heterostructure where you integrate a sacrificial layer. And now you make just sure that the layer on top doesn't have any strain gradient. It can have strain, but it is not allowed to have a strain gradient. Then you do some patterning that allows you again to access your sacrificial layer. You do a selective etching that removes the sacrificial layer and you will gain a membrane that will either bound back to the substrate as it's been shown here in this uh, schematic or that you then, if you are fast enough, can also transfer to a new host substrate. You can like, like with graphene, peel it off with PMD or you use in the, uh, in the beginning, we used simply tape as the guys from graphene and you can put it onto new substrates. So, and the interest inside this for these kind of structures were driven in the same way that they showed a lot of properties that you now also connect with two dimensional materials, but which are basically already present in this kind of systems. And basically the one that's been explored most is the co compliance that when you make your, um, system very thin. So what this very nice graph that's been done by John Rogers, like uh, many years later, what he basically shows is that you plot the six, uh, thickness against the uh, flexible rigidity, which is the resistance of a, of a body to being bent. And you know this like from day by day, if you have a book, a book is very rigid you know, because it's thick and you cannot bend it. But a piece of paper is, of course, extremely flexible. And this is basically inherent to all kinds of materials. Like if you make a material thin, it will become extremely flexible. And this flexibility allows this kind of formation of these rolled up tubes down to a radius that we have here, 50 nanometers, because like the layer that forms it, they're just two monolayers of indium arsenide, gallium arsenide that basically rolled up over the substrate surface. And the same kind of, of principle applies to the nanomembranes. Again, there, there you often see that they start to wrinkle, like, like basically a, a blanket that you put onto a table and it, it shows some wrinkles around. And this also comes because the material becomes extremely flexible and you can bend it into uh, great radiuses, which opens up several possible applications. So if I talk about applications, the, the question always arises for what use people this by now? No? So because the, the field has some 20 years by now. And there have been several um, 
possibilities or several things that people explore, which basically makes use of this kind of flexible material. One is uh, the use in optical resonators. And I will talk about this a little bit when I talk about optical properties in the next part. But um, also like the self-forming process is very interesting. So people suggested to make small capacitors to basically reduce the footprint of a capacitor on a, on a surface and increase capacitance by simply rolling up a flat capacitor into a rolled system. Because the layers start to build, uh, to bound back to themselves, we, it's also a nice way to make uh, junctions. And we, for example, this is the example of a semiconductor superconductor junction that we make where we basically had a, a enium gallium arsenide strain film and a, a niobium film. And then we roll it up and the semiconductor bounds back to um, the uh, superconductor and you basically sandwich the semiconductor between the two superconductors in a way that you can basically not grow it. And finally, since we talk about that the membranes are extremely flexible, there is a very large work from the group of Armando Rastelli that basically uses the fact that you can, that it's flexible so you can strain um, the membranes very good. And he integrates quantum emitters into this kind of flexible structure, puts them onto a piezoelectric substrate and uses this to tune the emission of the quantum emitters. So that's also very close to something that I will discuss in the next part. And if you look a little bit around, there's of course, again, the huge work of John Rogers that I don't know, wrote far too many natures and advanced materials to compete with, um, where he basically explores this kind of uh, thin membranes, mainly silicon uh, membranes, to make flexible electronics, which are artificial retinas, uh, sensors for the, the mouse. It's really amazing what these guys do with this system. So, but let's look into this example, how I can use the flexibility and the uh, strain state of my uh, tube that forms to basically do band structure engineering, which is also one of the main problems of semiconductor physics. So really right at the beginning of the field, people uh, came to the idea and saying like, oh, we're growing a semiconductor heterostructure. Why we just grow a bilayer? Let's integrate a quantum well into this, this whole thingy and let's roll this thingy up. So what you then gain is that you get the functionality of your uh, semiconductor heterostructure inside the tube walls. And this works uh, especially well for optical emitters because they are not very sensitive. So people tried also to use two dimensional electron gases, but there the thinness of the membrane normally leads to depletion and to a reduction of the mobility. But for optical properties that you can see in this very simple example that was one of the first samples that I've grown and made here in Brazil is like you put a quantum well inside the tube, you roll it up. And if you look at the PL spectrum, you see that the intensity of your quantum well and of your tube, they are very comparable. There is no degradation of the, the, uh, the optical emission of the heterostructure as it's being integrated into the tube. So, you can then use this to play around a little bit. And one of the functionalities that you think about it, if you have a tube, if you look at the diameter, it basically, you very quickly realize, look, this is somehow a ring resonator. Yeah? Like if I have a light source sitting in my tube wall and I have total reflection on the, on the uh, borders of my tube, simply due to the fact that normally the semiconductor has a much higher uh, refractive index than the surrounding air or the vacuum in your cryostat, I can confine light inside this round tube. And we did also now some calculation. Uh, so you can really nicely see this in FDDD calculations. If you make a very simple calculation and see how the electric light is confined and you get this kind of standing wave pattern that in your electric field that blinks. And this idea was pioneered in 2006 by a group from Hamburg by 
Kip that basically first demonstrated really nicely, okay, we can use this kind of rolled up tubes as a, as a ring resonator. And then later, people asked, what's the quality of these ring resonators? And actually the achieving quality factors are really high. So a group from Canada, which are formed by two Chinese, um, demonstrated three years later that you can easily build a laser made out of these rolled up nanotubes. So if you, the, 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 the optical quality of these self-formed optical resonators is really high and allows you to, to make real optical devices. But if you start looking at the physics, you actually see that your optical emitter that you integrate into the tube board undergoes uh, some certain stain, uh, changes. And that's related to the strain that you expose the system. So if you think of a classical heterostructure, uh, so um, if you think about an epitaxial heterostructure, everything has to have the same lattice parameter. So if you are on a gallium arsenide substrate, for example, you have to squeeze your indium gallium arsenide to the gallium arsenide lattice uh, parameter. And then afterwards, your, um, your gallium arsenide quantum well, it will be of course unstrained, but already the barriers are strained. And the strain state that you get is this typical uh, plain strain that you have. So you have some compression inside and you will have a reaction of the material to out of the plane. Now, as I said, like the driving force behind the formation of the tube is the relaxation of strain. So in the moment that the, the, you release the layer, the indium gallium arsenide it wants to relax, it wants to go to its uh, bulk lattice parameter. And of course the gallium arsenide is not very fun to relax because it is on its bulk lattice parameter and says, nah, nixta. <laughs> So what what you ha have you will you will have uh, uh, you will start to compress the gallium arsenide and the indium gallium arsenide will expand and it will find a new equilibrium and it will give a very interesting strain state that is quite unique to the structure. So you will have some two strain gradients uh, along the the tube radius and tangential to the tube radius and normally a constant strain state uh, along the cylinder that you roll up. And we could very early really show by um, measuring the strain state using X-ray diffraction and comparing it to photoluminescence that the strain state determines where the emission of my integrated emitter, in this case, is the, it is a gallium arsenide quantum well that's integrated into the tube, will happen. So the next step is if I have a unique strain state, can I use it to do some strain engineering and give new properties to this integrated quantum emitter, taking advantage of this new strain state? And this is the first work that I want to discuss a little bit in more detail here. Uh, so what we did in this work is we basically compared two structures. So we will have uh, a gallium arsenide substrate, some aluminium arsenide sacrificial layer, and here a structure that will roll up that has a gallium arsenide quantum well integrated. It's basically the same gallium arsenide quantum well that we used 12 years ago for the, the first paper that will give us a uh, reference. But for the second structure that we uh, investigated, we put an indium gallium arsenide quantum well inside into gallium arsenide barriers and we made sure that the barriers are actually slightly asymmetric. So what happens is that the final indium gallium arsenide quantum well, it will sit on a position where, where, it, where, it's, where it's outside the strain neutral plane. So it will really feel the strain state of the tube inside. So then we have to make the sample. So Basically what we do, we make some shallow etching to define the area of the tube that should roll up. That's normally this kind of huge shape. We make a second etching step where we open the trench to do the selective under etching. And then we do a selective under etching step that will give us a rolled up tube with the quantum well integrated. And as I said, it's like outside the neutral strain state. So it's highly straight. Like the, the samples look like this. No? You have here the starting edge. We have here the film that rolled up and the tube lying parallel to our starting edge with a diameter about five nanometer. And 
a wall that's been in the range of some uh, 60 nanometer thickness. The nice thing is, again, we uh, since we do epitaxy, now we have complete control over the strain state and we can measure the strain state. So we use high resolution XRD to determine the initial strain state of the, the structure. Yeah? And then we went to the synchrotron and we can do on the synchrotron uh, diffraction on the tubes to determine the strain state of the tubes. And with this knowledge of the strain state, we can then later feed them back into calculations to understand what's going on. But before discussing calculation, let's first do the experiment yeah, because we are experimental physicists. So let's measure the PL of, of our samples. So for this work, actually, we did two methods. We measured the PL and we did photoluminescence excitations. What you basically do in photoluminescence excitation is you measure the strength of your PL signal as a function of the energy of your excitation laser. And as you can imagine, like, like in absorption, if you hit a resonance, like if you hit a direct transition inside your material, you will enhance the um, PL signal. And basically the spectra will be very comparable to absorption spectra. So we can calculate the abs uh, absorption spectra and compare it to our PLE spectra. So, and here are the uh, spectra that we obtained from our structure. So we start with the flat Galli Marcenite quantum well that has a nice PL. And if we start now doing the PLE, so we start tuning the energy of our uh, uh, laser, measuring basically the, the intensity of this PL peak here, we find, of course, the first transition that is responsible for the main signal of this quantum well, which will be the transition of an electron in the heavy hole to the, to the gamma point and the recombination of them. If we then tune the energy further, we will find a second uh, state in our quantum well. In our case, this will be given by the light hole of the, of the band structure that goes to the gamma point and recombines. And this gives the second peak right here in, in our PLE spectra. So, and if you compare this with the absorption spectra, you basically get this kind of staircase um, uh, configuration. So for people that did solid state physics and had to learn density of states, now this is the typical density of states that you get for a two-dimensional system like a quantum well, where you say like, look, you have the, you have this kind of, st uh, of step case in the density of states. And every time now you, you hit a new um, state inside your particle in the box, you get another, you get a second state sitting on top of this. Um, of course, for the quantum well here, there sits the, the, there's some exciton binding energy that makes these kind of peaks. But a particle in the box, everybody that did particle in the box and remembers the outcome of the Schrodinger equation, it's basically what describes the system. So if we now go to the rolled up cube, we measure the same gallium arsenide quantum well. The first thing is we see that the uh, PL is redshifted as we would expect due to the strain state. But what, we, what is new on these measurements, what has not been done before, is now with the PLE, we can uh, probe the whole band structure. So we not just see the, the main recombination of the heavy hole with the gamma uh, electron, uh, but we also see the light hole. And what we clearly see is that these two peaks are much closer together. That indicates that, uh, that the two states of the uh, uh, heavy hole and the light hole, which are normally separated uh, due to the uh, different relative mass of them, will move together and they become much closer, indicating a change in the band structure. And we see this also in our uh, calculated absorption spectra. But basically, we also see that we that the behavior of the material does not change and uh, it still behaves like a quantum well. Things get really different if you look at the indium gallium arsenide. So I will do this much quicker. So the flat indium gallium arsenide looks like the, the flat gallium arsenide. You have the recombination of the heavy hole with the light hole. And then later you have the light hole and the, uh, no, you have the heavy hole with the gamma recombination. And then later you have the light hole with the gamma recombination. Since the uh, ma material is compressed to the uh, lattice structure of the, of the, of gallium arsenide, the separation between these two states is much larger. 
But things get really interesting if you suddenly look at the tube, because the tube again shows a redshift of the PL, but it loses completely, the PLE loses completely the typical structure that we would expect from, uh, from a two-dimensional system. Actually, it has a peak and then there's not much um, variation anymore. There is some, some higher recombination states here, but we cannot clearly identify anymore the recombination that we could identify for all the other systems. So this really indicates there's going something fundamentally on with the band structure. Uh, and to understand this, we basically have to carry out band structure calculations. So um, in our days, you don't need to be an expert in KP theory. You can you find software that does KP theory for you. And we were very happy that there is a very nice software around where we basically can that we basically can use to do this kind of band structure um, calculation and that actually we also use to calculate the absorption spectrum that I showed before. So again, uh, so we can do uh, our quantum mechanics 101 particle in the box for the gallium arsenide quantum well. We basically see that the um, heavy hole and light hole band edge, they are degenerated as we expected. And we have the two energy levels for the heavy hole and light hole um, wave functions. So the first surprise actually came to us when we were looking at the band edge alignment for the rolled up tube. So what's happened is that the strain state in the tube is so unique that it does something that normally doesn't happen. In, in, in If you work with planar layers, you move the light hole band edge over the heavy hole band edge. And that's the reason that suddenly the difference between these two energy levels that we've seen in PL reduces, but it does not invert you know, because the, the difference in relative mass is still uh, so large that the light hole energy level lies below the heavy hole energy level. But it tells us already what most likely happens in the indium gallium arsenide quantum well. So for the indium arsenide uh, uh, quantum well, we see that the compressive strain of the epitaxial growth, now it lifts the heavy hole far up over the light hole band edge, as everybody um, has been known for some long time. And we have this huge separation between these uh, two band stages, as we see it in PL and in our PLE measurements. But again, things start really to be interesting when we now look at the calculated energy levels and band edges for the rolled up tube. First, we see the inversion of the light hole and heavy hole band edge. And second, our band edge of the heavy hole is so deep that it basically coincides with the barrier states of the light hole. So what happens is that the heavy hole does not have its own ground state anymore. And we have just the ground state of the light hole. And in practice, actually, it means that these two uh, electron wave functions, they start to intermix. and for this reason, we think the PL is so, so flat. But if these two wave functions intermix, there will be a breakdown of the selection rules. So how do we probe selection rules in optics? Well, actually, uh, my, uh, the guys that do uh, optical spectroscopy for me, uh, Odolon and Fernando, they always know. So you use uh, circular polarized light. So what we do now, we repeat the experiment, but we use circular polarized light to basically see uh, on the polarization level, the selection rules of our material. So again, the, uh, the PLE spectra now with circular polarized light with sigma plus and sigma minus, it reassembles the structure that we've seen before. But we see that for minus polarized light, it is far less than for, uh, for uh, sigma plus polarized light. And we have a polarization degree of typical 30 deg uh, degree and a little bit more if we are below the energy level of the, of the light hole. And it drops significantly on the position of the light hole and then increases a little bit more afterwards. So that's very standard what we see. And I think people most likely measured this somewhere in the 90s already. And we are in complete agreement with this. Now, if we look at the gallium arsenide tube and make the same experiment, we see that 
the polarization level decreases already slightly, but we still can identify exactly in the polarization, the position of the light hole and the structure or the, the polarization behavior looks very similar to the flat quantum well, just with the difference that the difference between the heavy hole and the light hole shrink as, it, as we expect. Now, if we look at the enium gallium arsenide quantum well, the polarization degree is much higher for the, the flat structure. It's about 60%. And then if we are close to the light hole, uh, case it really drops drastically down to quasi zero and then it's very small in the beginning. Also, this is a well known fact and or well known measurement, and we can really show that okay, our flat structures behave like we, uh, they should behave. But the final spectrum is, of course, the one of the indium gallium arsenide tube, and basically, what we see is that the optical selection rules that govern. Uh, the transition between the light hole and the heavy hole, they are completely gone. Like, basically, there is no polarization anymore. So that means that both, um, both lights are uh, equally able to excite the hole and the, uh, the, the heavy hole and the light hole electrons, and they are able to recombine. And, the, and in this way, we change completely the behavior of the quantum emitter that's integrated into the tube into something that is actually not a that you cannot be able to do simply by applying a strain uh, just in plane it gives rise to a unique optical behavior of the structure that cannot be achieved otherwise which basically is the reason we claim that we can do some bent structure engineering using these uh, tubes so following a little bit the same idea is um, to use uh, this kind of nanomembranes that are compliant as a virtual substrate for growth. And again, we will try to use it to, um, to tune the optical properties of heterostructures that we grow on top of it. So let's think a little bit about the idea of a virtual substrate. Actually, people that started working uh, with this kind of rolled up tubes and nanomembranes, they are all uh, semiconductor epitaxy guys, especially the group of Max Lagali um, is well known for their work on, on uh, semiconductor heterostructures and, and work on, on germanium quantum dots mainly. And they were the first one that said like, look, I will take this membrane and I will use it as a virtual substrate. And they've seen a tremendous change in the growth behavior of their germanium dots on top of a freestanding um, uh, membrane. And the reason is that we have suddenly some strain transfer to the membrane. And we had a strong collaboration with the Lagali group and we started to grow on re partly released indium gallium arsenide membranes here. And we've seen basically the same effect that growth behavior on top of this kind of flexible and released structures change drastic, uh, drastically. So for, the, for this kind of basic experiments, let's talk a little bit, how do you make your, your samples now? Like for these partly released structures, we defined round mesas. We did some under etching that will release the thin membrane uh, on top of these mesas. And uh, they will relax. Normally, they relax to their bulk lattice constant. But of course, they are geometrically confined. So what happens is they have to build some wrinkles to basically, since they will get larger, they have somehow to uh, accommodate this extra materials. And they will build these kind of wrinkles. And then we started to overgrow them. And as you see here with, with in this SEM images, we see immediately that the material likes to accumulate on top of the wrinkles and form these big clusters. And if you think about it from a thermodynamics point of view, it's very easy to understand. So if you look, or oh, it starts, it's always nasty to say it's easy to understand. No, it, we, we <laughs> We, we thought that we, we have a very good grasp of this idea. So basically what we have here is a cross-section AFM image 
of the height. So we have the unreleased part, then there is a, a step where we go down to the membrane, and this is the wrinkle, and you see the wrinkle of the membrane, they, they really get high. Yeah? So, um, and what we then thought is like, we have to think about the lattice parameter. Yeah? So as I said, the lattice parameter will relax. So on this area, we will be at the bulk lattice parameter of the gallium arsenide substrate. In this area where the membrane is flat, it will uh, go to the bulk lattice parameter of the indium gallium arsenide. But the wrinkle by itself, ne, it curves outwards the lattice parameter. So the lattice parameter on top of the wrinkle will be even bigger than the bulk lattice parameters. And now you can think about misfit strain. Ne? So misfit strain means like what's the difference in lattice parameter basically divided by the, the lattice parameter of the material of your interest. So, and for enium arsenide that's been grown in these examples, ne, this misfit strain is some 7% as we see around here, but it reduces um, to 1.5% if you're on top of the wrinkle. So without uh, going into details, you can immediately think like if the enium arsenide can choose, it will of course like to go on top of the wrinkle because the lattice parameter is much closer to its bulk lattice parameter than on the, the gallium arsenide substrate where it normally has to squeeze itself extremely to fit and make an epitaxial growth. And you can go one step further. Né? So you can use this kind of strain information to basically calculate the surface energy of your structure. Né? So for the indium gallium arsenide, the surface energy will be very high on the unreleased part. It will drop drastically on the released part and it will be um, very low on top of the wrinkle. And now you can do a Monte Carlo simulation. That's basically things that experimentalists do when they are in lockdown. Né? So you have some three months time to uh, do some coding. So you let things diffuse and since the diffusion of the indium arsenide is extremely high on the gallium arsenide, you uh, simulate some 5 million cycles, which is some two seconds of the material on the surface and you look on the, on the final state. And then basically you see what you intuitively expected is that the material starts to go to the membrane. And if you look carefully, you see that there's more dots of which represent our atoms that diffused on the surface at this position. And then you have to do, of course, the statistic as we did it here. And then you clearly see, yes, there's like double the amount of uh, material on top of the wrinkle. And as I said, like, this is extremely, uh, like the, the, the simulations are not extremely uh, uh, fast, but in terms of growth, this is like two seconds of the growth that normally takes some three minutes. And already in two seconds, you see a clear material accumulation right on top of the wrinkle. And you see again here that the, the membrane basically is a perfect sink for the material. That means that everything that once stepped onto the membrane will never leave the membrane again and it will accumulate on the membrane. And this lets us understand this kind of growth behavior. So now that we understand a little bit how growth works on it, you will ask like, but why should I do it? No? We should always ask, like, why should we, we do stuff? So, and we suggest that you can solve two old problems of epitaxy using this, uh, this technique. One is the problem of the substrate. Now, if you see this is the, what they call the land map of semiconductor uh, uh, or three, five semiconductors, you have lattice constant as a function of band gap. And, but you see that basically, for 3.5, you have two commercial substrates, gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. And that's the substrate that are available for you. But normally you want, like if you 3.5 epitaxy is important because you want to grow laser structures and you want to grow laser structures that emit at 1.55 micrometer, because that's basically what powers our internet. So you have to grow an indium gallium arsenide alloy. And this indium gallium arsenide alloy sits somewhere here. So it's always strained. There's no substrate around. No? So normally people grow on indium phosphide, which is much more expensive and much smaller than the gallium arsenide. And of course, people would love to grow on silicon. No? So, but silicon, the, the, the lattice mismatch is extremely large and you have no chance of growing on it. 
which brings us to the, the other graph over here. Now that's the problem of critical sickness. That's related to your substrate problem. So we know very well that the, the more enium you put in, the thinner your enium arsenide or enium gallium arsenide is that you can grow on top of your substrate before it will introduce dislocations. And dislocations are very bad because they kill the optical properties. No? So uh, laser that an indium gallium arsenide laser that has threading dislocations inside that will not emit light anymore. So you cannot, your internet will not work. Uh, so you have to overcome this problem. And already in the 19th, um, this guy Law made a, made a suggestion like if you make your substrate just thin enough, it will actually be able to get some of the strain inside and compensate for the strain. And we did some similar uh, calculations for enium arsenide on silicon. And you can really show if you make a very thin membrane, you can get in down, you can put enough strain into your substrate that the rest of the strain is most likely able to be accommodated by the material and it would have a better growth. And we very early seen that there is really the possibility of strain transfer to the substrate. So when we grow some indium arsenide dots on, on silicon membranes, we see that the membrane is buckling up, indicating that it's strained by the indium gallium arsenide that's been put on it. And as well, we see it in the X-ray diffraction where we see a better coherence of this one. So now the question is, can we really use it for making device structures? And I will. So we decided to try this really on an indium gallium arsenide membrane, or actually on a gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide membrane. And it has a lattice, bulk lattice parameter that's outside the range of normal substrates. And the uh, production is the same as we always see now. So we have the strained layer here. We underedge the sacrificial layer to get a backbound membrane that then makes these wrinkles. But you see areas here are very large to that you have even flat uh, material that you can grow on. And what happens when you make a total release, sometimes uh, your membrane sw swims away and it leaves a mesa without membrane, which is actually very nice because you win your reference inside because here we have the bare gallium arsenide substrate. And then we can start overgrowing these structures. No? So just to give some, some details of the, the, the overgrowth here. So we normally do a hydrogen cleaning to remove the native oxide. We check the surface quality with reed. And then basically we do a standard epitaxial growth. The only thing is it has to be at low temperature because the membranes start to get instable at very high temperature. And what we then can do is we can systematically grow different indium gallium arsenide layers, increasing the indium content in them and leaving the layer thickness constant. And this is the scanning electron microscopy of this kind of, of a systematic study. So we started something with 5% of of enium inside and we actually went up to 100% and here we have 10, 30, 40 and 50% of enium inside and everything is grown 10 nanometer onto the membrane. And basically we see for until 30% of enium where there's, uh, where there's a good strain accommodation, the material likes to grow on the flat areas and not so much on top of the wrinkles. And what's also important, the membrane obviously stays intact, so it's not damaged by the growth. Suddenly, if we have a 40 to 50%, we see a change in the growth behavior. You see it very nicely in this SEM image and, you, and in this SEM image. First, the material starts with 50% to get rough, which indicates that it's not epitaxial anymore. And the material likes to accumulate on the top of the wrinkles. Now, so again, remembering the Monte Carlo simulation, it's very clear that like, oh, the lattice parameter is so big, it wants to go on to top of the wrinkle to minimize its surface energy. We can compare this with uh, atomic force microscopy images, which give a better, better idea of, of, the, uh, um, of the surface quality. And again, we can see that up to 30% of indium gallium arsenide inside, we have a very good growth on our membrane that's comparable to our reference. Actually, our reference is worse because it has some carbon de defects. And if we go to a higher indium concentrations here, we see 
actually that there is a change in the growth behavior on the membrane compared to the flat layers. Actually, there is some kind of nucleation going on, so we are on the border of the critical thickness, but on the flat area, we already overcome the critical thickness and we see the formation of this kind of dots and indicating that here the material is actually incoherent and gone. With 50%, we suddenly see the formation of this kind of bubble, so the material puts so much strain into the, the surface that it lifts up um, the membrane from its uh, surface and then material likes to accumulate on top of the surface whereas the the and this is also true for the 100 percent and of course with this high indium con concentrations with this thick uh, thick uh, with this large thicknesses the growth on a flat bulk substrate looks horrible um, when we can put strain into the membrane and that we stay coherent we also see with in-plane uh, X-ray uh, diffraction. So basically what we do, we shine under a shallow angle X-rays and then uh, instead of using a point detector, we use a Pilatus detector that allows to make a snapshot of the reciprocal space. And then we can identify where's the lattice constants of our material. And basically for low material, we see that we stay coherent to our substrate. So our membrane sits uh, relaxed somewhere below the gallium arsenide. For enium content that is below the official bulk lattice parameter of the gallium arsenide, we compress a little bit the membrane. And then for higher stuff, we see that we get a nice balance of the layer and the layer stays coherent. And even for very high enium content, actually we see that even so with 40%, we have the indication that there's some relaxation going, uh, starting to happen. We see that things do not relax anymore to the bulk lattice parameter. Even with 50%, we have an intermediate strain state where the material is able to compress or the membrane is able to, to pick some of the strain and everything is in an intermediate uh, strain state and we really have some strain transfer to our membrane. So as the last results, what does this mean for a device being grown on the membrane? So again, we make, a, uh, we make a device out of a quantum well. In this case, it's an indium gallium arsenide quantum well, and it's one time grown on a standard bulk gallium arsenide substrate and one time on an indium gallium arsenide substrate, which has now an indium gallium arsenide membrane, which has basically the same lattice parameter. And what we see is that the reference, it has a very nice uh, small PL, but also the quantum well grown on the uh, membrane has a very good PL. And what's more important, it's red shifted down to lower energies indicate, and, it's exact, and it is exactly there where we would expect it if there would be no strain in the quantum well, which indicates that this idea of like avoiding the shift of energy due to the lattice strain works very well with these membranes and these membranes would be a good virtual substrate to grow unstrained material basically and since they are transferable you could transfer them to silicon and grow an unstrained indium gallium arsenide quantum well on a silicon substrate afterwards which is technological of course very interesting so that brings me to my summary of this talk so i hope i could convince you that there's like two very interesting structures going around, one that are based on uh, semiconductor uh, membranes. One is rolled up tubes, and we can use these rolled up tubes to strain engineer the emission of light of an indium gallium arsenide quantum well in a unique way, because the tube offers uh, a unique strain state that we basically do not find in any other configuration. And this is of course interesting since the, we can also build um, optical emitters and resonators. We basically can in this way make self-formed optical uh, resonators with a unique uh, emission and absorption characterization. And the same kind of, of strain or in this case, anti-strain engineering can be done uh, using this kind of flexible membranes as a virtual substrate. So we again can either put strain of our grown material into the 
into our substrate, uh, extending the range where we can grow it, or we can even offer a neutral new substrate to grow structures that normally are not be easy to grow on a standard bulk substrate because there's no uh, matching lattice parameter available and I can grow on unstrained structures in wavelength ranges which I normally have the problem to not, not able to reach without straining the material. Finally, I have to acknowledge a lot of people. Uh, so I have to acknowledge all the students that being involved into this work, which is Simon Filippi that made his PhD with me and uh, I Newton uh, Garcia, which was a, a master's or actually a scientific initiation student and, uh, and a technician in the lab. They are both now in Austria working for Armando Rastelli. There was Leonardo uh, Rodriguez involved in this one, which who is now a professor in Visosa. And there's another IC student involved here, Lucas de Concesson. And there's a strong collaboration since ever and ever with the GPO group. Uh, of the Physics Institute, mainly Odolon and Fernando, that do all the optical measurements uh, for me because I'm not a spectroscopist. And there's a long standing collaboration with doing X ray diffraction. So the X rays on the, uh, on the membranes were well done together with Sergio Morellon. And I have a long history of working with Angelo Malakias from UFMG. Uh, of doing X-ray diffraction on tubes and basically everything else that comes uh, in our hands. Uh, I like to thank, of course, the founding uh, agencies, uh, CMPQ and FAPES, and we use a lot the facilities of the LNIS and the LNNANO. So, and then I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. Uh, very nice talk, very interesting materials. So this, uh, this seminar is open to questions. Uh, does anyone have uh, questions? I see that, uh, uh, that Agner is there. Uh, Peter is a specialist in 2D uh, semiconductors. So uh, I, have, I have a a few questions, uh, or maybe Edson wants to. I think Edson should uh, acknowledge that he was the organizer of the conference you came here in Oberlandia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, actually, I, I I I went to the web page and saw you gave a talk on Tuesday at 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to apologize that I. Because I didn't remember that. Yeah, actually, my student Simon Filippi he, he took part of this overgrowth results, and I think he had a better spot. He had Levon on Terza, I think, <laughs> if I remember. Um, okay, uh, thank you for your nice talk. And my, I'm not experimentally, so my my question may be very naive, but I, I it's a, it's amazing how you can deform and grow this material or grow and then deform the 2D material. So my so my my when you show the the, the, the tube where you made these two layers essentially right two layers and then yes. you roll it over. Um so let let me let me try to to I exemplify my question. So suppose now you're rolling the 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 the, the sheet and then how how good is this connection when you you bring these two edges ah, together? How yeah, well, actually, it? it's not really a tube. It builds a snail. I can I can let me let me show you this because we have you can see it very nicely. Let me see. Yeah, if this gets bigger, you see it very nicely here. Ne? So basically, oh, what okay. you have you have the material and it goes around, but it's not really a tube in the in the classical sense. It will bound back on the top, and it, you will get a snail structure that that rolls up. So oh. um, and and it, and unfortunately. Lattices are incoherent, so we we were hoping always that, like in the bounding process, we would get a coherent lattice. But unfortunately, they don't they 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 blend in incoherently. Otherwise, it would really be a 
well, you can still create super lattices with it, but they are normally incoherent along along this direction. Ah, I see. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I probably have more questions, but let 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 us hear uh, some further questions. Thank you. Uh, I have I have a couple of questions. If nobody can ask anything right now, um, well, uh, we are. Uh, at the moment, we theorists are very interested in spin orbit effects. Uh, have you have you thought about using this uh, strain to uh, manipulate spin orbit effects? And what Actually, materials are you using for that? Um, I have not thought about it, but theorists have thought about it, and my former postdoc Leonardo read about it, and he started to do the experiment. So you have some. You, we were expecting to indeed see some different in the, the spin orbit coupling, and the idea was to roll up a, a two-dimensional electron gas and do some optical probing of this two-dimensional electron gas. Okay. He okay. did the experiment, and then he went away to Vizosa and never analyzed the data. I think. Oh, okay, Odo, that's Odo, it. and Fernando wrote him several emails. I wrote him emails. If he's present, I will will remind him again that he promised okay. to analyze the data and and to to really try to to see something. So what what you actually then have also to do? You not only you have to do magnetopia. And Fernando and Odolon, they have the, 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 the possibilities to do this. So you okay. have to put it into a cryostat and you have to apply a magnetic field. But then okay. you should see some effects. Okay. Um, the other question is you mentioned that uh, people would love to be able to grow on top of silicon. Are you trying to build or did you build? Uh, did you build? Uh, these ma this, uh, wrinkled membranes with uh, silicon and try to grow stuff on top of it we, or not? We, we tried this. No? So we, we did, and basically in this, no, in, in basically in this work, this is a silicon membrane that's been overgrown. So you can, ah, okay. Use, some okay. you can use some silicon on insulator, under edge it, and then try to grow the, 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 the material directly on it. And yes, as I said, we, we see some strain accommodation and growth is better, but silicon is still a nasty substrate for, for, for indium, indium arsenide and it still does not like to grow very well on it. Okay. Um, so what's most likely a better strategy and unfortunately people in Europe that have good connections already did this. So what they did is they took an indium phosphide membrane and put it onto a silicon wafer where uh, Leyte built some silicon waveguides under it and they grown as on the indium phosphide a 3-5 laser that couples into the directly into the, the silicon uh, waveguides below. So it were, so that's most likely a much better strategy. Um, unfortunately, it's technologically very challenging. So these are guys that work together with Leyte, which is one of these big semiconductor companies of France. And they have a huge silica, uh, they have a huge processing lab where they can really do nice transfers. And I've seen his talk this uh, year on the on the materia condensata and was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's what was very nice. Unfortunately, you are much faster than us in the uh -huh. Yeah, well, we 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 do what we can, right? Yeah. Uh, so let me see if there is uh, if there is no other question. I. Uh, Okay, I, I'm not not completely sure I understand. Uh, the, these wrinkles, they are random, or you have a way to control their, their shape? And, it, uh, it depends on your etching process. So if you under etch very aggressive, like we did this uh, in some of the samples, they are rel rel relatively random. But we've shown, like if you under it, extremely slow, there's uh, happening some autocorrelation process. So you can do some very wonderful basic physics on autocorrelation and self-ordering, and then you get really some ordered wrinkled networks. But it uh, demands also a, a, a good lithography that we do not have here in Brazil. So we were like in, this was 
we did this on, on in Dresden. There we had an e-beam lithography and we could, um, um, and we, we really see that there's some self-ordering involved. Okay, nice, nice. Um, there is Arbiner is asking a question here, your colleague. I have a question. Do you think such a, a role well, the uh, tubes could be done with TMDs. Uh, the, the answer is yes, we did it already. Like, right? well, but, what right is edge, a TMD? Uh, uh, transition dicalcemide, uh, transition metal dicalcemide, oh, moly okay. sulfide, uh, moly sulfide. So what what you can do is you can use the semiconductor tubes as a carrier and roll in the two two uh, D material. Actually, there's a work together with Angelo Malakias that they basically transferred a graphene onto a, onto a tube template and then rolled in the tube. And then you yeah. can, in this way, integrate the 2D material into the rolled up tube. Um, using, using pure TMDs will be hard because uh, the van der Waals epitaxy normally doesn't do any strain. Now, to make the, 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 the tube, you need a strain gradient. So normally you need a good lattice, uh, and the easiest or most controlled way is to get a lattice mismatch. It's the reason why the first tubes were all done with 3.5 or, or silicon germanium semiconductors because with the epitaxy you have an extremely good control over the built-in strain into the bilayer uh, because we have very good control of, about the alloying and then about the lattice mismatch between layers. Well, I am curious, what is the uh, typical formula of this uh, TMD? Molly, uh, MO, SO, DOIS, no? Ah, okay, okay. M or, M o uh, no, tungsten, Molly, uh, tungsten sulfide, the uh, tungsten selenides, no? They, they, they are very... Okay. Uh, what uh, is... Besides the, 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 the big the big wave of... 2D materials that that's going around. Okay, okay. Um, so I asked about the spin orbit, the silicon membrane. How how many uh, how how thin can you make these uh, these membranes? Uh, I assume that at some point uh, that there is a minimum uh, width uh, or well, thickness. Uh, I actually would be surprised. So in my PhD, I rolled up one monolayer of indium arsenide over one monolayer of gallium arsenide. So really, huh. really, you can make them extremely, extremely thin. It basically depends how good is your selective action. So the reason the the three five or actually the three arsenic system is used so much for doing this kind of structure is that there is a huge selectivity between the indium gallium arsenide and the aluminium arsenide. And it, we're talking about something like one to 10 million. So you can extremely well etch away aluminium arsenide with uh, hydrofluoric acid without doing any etching to any of the other three fives. Okay. Um, so and of course you basically, can release these thin layers. No? So, uh, so obviously, none of these two exist as a as a monolayer, right? No, none of them. You no. need always uh, you need a bilayer. No? So you need a bilayer. Otherwise, you don't have any any strain. No? Okay, okay. Uh, and the the bonding wouldn't work, also, right? Yes, no, like well, the bonding of course could work between. Between uh, between monolayers as well. Actually, yeah, yeah. There, have been, there have been some calculations once that if you be in vacuum, the surface reconstruction of the of a pure silicon layer would include of a single silicon layer should have enough strain that it starts to curl up. But the problem is, of course, you have to then create release your 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 tube in an environment that allows for a surface recombination. So that's not anymore a wet chemical et uh, etching process, no? because this is all done in wet chemical et etching. No? So basically you take your sample and you put it into HF. So there is no surface reconstruction, anything involved. No? Okay. Um, so um, any more questions from, from anyone? Uh, I, 
I, I, I have uh, another maybe a basic question. Uh, and your, your experiment is uh, is performed in slightly higher temperature. So my probably you, what is the temperature typical temperature you prefer the measurement? The measurement, no, actually, so which measurement? So the PL is normally done in low temperature. No, normally we, we do the PL of our structures in 10 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, the material sure. is grown, of course, in MBE around 480 degrees Celsius. Thermal couple temperature and now we can, and we can start a philosophical discussion if the thermal temperature has something to do with your surface temperature or not. But it is, of course, the material growth is done at high temperature. But then things are cooled down to room temperature. We take it out of the, the molecular beam epitaxy machine. And then we do uh, optical lithography to define the, the, the patterns that we under etch. And the etching is basically done at room temperature in a water-based HF solution. and then all the optical characterization uh, actually the tubes show some optical activity at, uh, at room temperature but to to have good confinement and so on everything is done at 10 15 kelvin okay uh, but so in connection to that is uh, my question is has, i think you didn't mention about phono mode in this tube so are, are, can you think in PL a measurement some no you these. can not see the phonon modes in PL but there's a work from a group in Spain where we they got very small tubes from us they seen breathing modes in Rama, Rama ah, ah, okay. uh, mm -hmm. so they, they went uh, they did brion zone scattering and they seen some breathing ah, I see but let's say for the quantum well structures, it's very unlikely because the, the diameters are relatively large and the um, mm -hmm. material is relatively thick, like 60 nanometers, as I said. Now we can, uh, so there's some, always some discussion if this is already microtube, nanotube, uh, it's like, there's like a lot of definition around and a lot of, um, in German, you would say splitting the hair. No? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, any more any more questions from anyone? So, if uh, if not, we sh we should thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, thank you for agreeing to present your work to us. And uh, wow, it was a ple it was of course a pleasure on from my side. No? I always have to say this. It's always nice to be invited and being able to talk about your your. Thank work. you so much. Uh, let me see. Apparently, there was uh, no. It's just uh, thank. And Abner answered here. What are the TMDs? They are molybdenum disulfide, WSC2, and hafnium S2. What is W? W. Ah, tungsten. Yeah, tungsten. Yeah, right. Uh, the experimentalists know the periodic table much better than us. <laughs> we know carbon, nitrogen, uh, silicon, gallium, arsenic, and that's it. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be uh, writing to you soon to ask for the slides because we post the slides together with the, uh, with yeah. the uh, talk. So. I, I hope that they, I, I think there's a possibility to export them as PDF. I will find.